Hey guys, if you're watching this, you're probably interested in either Heroes of the Storm or Dota 2 or both. I want to use this video as a chance to kind of onboard Heroes of the Storm players into Dota 2, if that's something you've been thinking about, but you feel kind of intimidated about going into another MOBA. I made that journey myself, and as you know, I've played Heroes of the Storm for seven years and have enjoyed it so much, and recently I've been on the Dota 2 tear, and I've gone from zero MMR to 4,000, and it's been a great journey. But a lot of people that watch me, they have some experience with Heroes of the Storm, but they may find Dota a little daunting. So I want to start with a list of similarities in skills that may feel transferable from Heroes of the Storm to Dota 2, which goes further than just being able to turn on the computer and having an internet connection and knowing how to install games. Uh, and then I want to talk about the differences, specifically things that Dota 2 has that Heroes of the Storm does not have. Of course, Heroes of the Storm has some many unique things as well that uh, Dota 2 doesn't have, but we're now looking at the onboarding from HOTS into Dota 2. Maybe next time we can do it the opposite. And in fact, I've done some videos like that as well. So let's begin. Similarities. They're both 5-on-5 five five MOBAs. They both have a hero like Stitches or Pudge, you know, pudgy guy with a hook. And they're always overconfident idiots that are griefing the game as well. Well, kind of, not always, but we've seen too many of them. Uh, various map objectives outside of the main objective, which is killing the opponent's core in hearts, thrown in Dota 2. There's experience gain through killing neutrals and heroes. You can level up and pick new abilities, or you can improve existing abilities. You have roles, like roughly, you have like tank, damage dealer, uh, support or healer. Uh, these roles exist in both games and they kind of work. And then there is an unranked and a ranked mode. Uh, when you have a ranked mode, there's a draft with bans where you can eliminate some OP heroes or heroes you don't like playing against. And the base game is free. But I have to put a little asterisk there because in Heroes of the Storm, the base game is free, but you start with like two heroes for free and then like 10 or 14 on free rotation that week and everything else has to be purchased either by grinding which will take many hundreds of hours or thousands of hours or with money and that's something that we accepted as loyal blizzard fans and you know it is what it is and games do need to make money but uh dota 2 has the route of aesthetics and esports support which draws money from you, you know, loot chests Welcome and skins, uh, and Dota 2 Plus, Travis, which is like a battle months. pass essentially. And Heroes of the Storm, there's also money for buying heroes. So Dota 2, you can actually play the whole game for free without ever spending, which is very attractive, of course, for many people. Now let's talk about some differences. I've got a couple of differences right here. <laughs> so let's begin with the beginning. A couple of differences. Right? All heroes are free. Uh, heroes gain and lose gold and can use it to buy items or revive themselves. So that's an interesting one. In Heroes of the Storm, there's only XP gain and it is shared among all heroes. Whenever anything of the opponent dies, you get experience if you were near enough and your whole team does. In Dota 2, you have specific roles, namely position 1, carry, 2, mid lane, Three, offlane, four, support, and then five is hard support. And this is also the farm ladder. One is allowed to hit creeps first if there is a contest between two people. Some sometimes this doesn't get followed because of griefers or people misunderstand or they get greedy or whatever. But generally, if all these guys are together, carry is allowed to hit the units. Uh, and then two and then three and then four and then five. Five and one are in a lane together. Four and three are, are in a lane together, and two is mid lane alone. That is the current configuration. This was different in the past, and it may change in the future, but that's the current configuration. So anytime you hit creeps and kill them with the last hit, just like Nazebo or Asmodan might in Heroes of the Storm, uh, you get gold for that and XP. And your opponent can mess with that. When creeps drop below half-life, they can start hitting their own creeps and try to deny them. If they land the last hit, there's a little exclamation mark and you are denied all of the gold and some of the experience, half, I believe. So that makes the laning phase really interesting. More about that later. But anyway, there's gold and you will lose some if you die. 
so it is not definitely in the bank. Dota 2 has an active working reporting system. We all have known for a long time that in HOTS the reporting system is completely automated. It is density, volume by time. So the more reports you get in the shorter period of time, the more likely you get an automatic mute. But you never get banned from the server, you never get a tap on the wrist, behavior score uh, decrease or whatever. And if you take a look here in Dota 2, every week you get a conduct summary, 10,000 is the highest because I'm a good boy. And uh, I saw someone in my Discord recently that we banned immediately for low behavior score. He had like 3,000. I don't want any shitters in my Discord, so... They're... No, I didn't kick them. I believe in redemption. But seriously, what do you have to do to drop to like 3,000? It's, it's horrible, no? It's, it's not good, I would say. Not good at all, is it? So, um, commence is something you can do after a game to say good job to your teammates. And this actually raises your score. If you abandon, it drops your score automatically. Don't even have to be reported for it. And if you do get reported, then it may cost you some behavior score if it happens a lot. So this is kind of a self-regulating system. And then you also have the Overwatch system, which uh, you can watch cases of alleged cheating, either via manual player reporting or via automated trigger of the uh, Valve software. Valve is the developer of Dota 2. And you can try to see, is this person cheating? Are they map hacking? Are they scripting or whatever? And then if you think they are, then you can say, I think they're guilty. And then they thank you for your uh, support. They thank you for your uh, investigation. So this is, uh, uh, many people will say that it's not perfect now, some people think the reporting system is trash in dota 2 and i would invite you to play any blizzard game and then dare to say again that the dota system is trash because believe you me it costs a lot of resources to uh, maintain reporting systems and to process these things it costs money the only reason the dev would do it is because they are altruistic and out of the goodness of their heart or because it maintains the player bases health better but it is an investment, don't underestimate it. And I'm really glad and happy that Dota 2 has it. There's a well-working replay system with minimal bugs, which actually offers... <laughs> I know, this is hard to believe for us hot stands. You can speed up more than two times! I know, Heroes of the Storm has an A-time replay speed, but we all know it doesn't work. It was never well optimized in the adopted SC2 engine that was built uh, for Heroes of the Storm. SC2 engine was the baseline for HOTS, and then it was slowly altered over the years. But that game was never intended to run as a MOBA, that engine. It was tinkered with, but for some reason they never did more effort on the replay system. So, I just don't watch replays in HOTS! And I'm pretty sure nobody does, because... HOTS is a game to play, it's like Mario Brothers, it's Mario Party. Uh, you just... You, you battle, uh, there is depth as well, depth that belies its uh, seeming simplicity on the surface, which I've greatly enjoyed, but uh, most people won't be digging into their replays to analyze things, and the bad replay system makes it pretty tough to do as well. There is a very fast reconnect system. In Dota, you have people actually opening the door for pizza and disconnecting themselves from the game as they do it to make it more likely that opponents and allies will wait for them. It actually works. Sometimes they're just picking their nose, they just want a break and they, they disconnect from the game and they know they can come back in, in seconds. This kind of confidence is crazy because as a HOTS player, when you disconnect, you know it could take one or 10 minutes or maybe you can never get back in again. So uh, that's pretty nice. And you know, sometimes you do have a legitimate disconnect and you're back in in seconds, it's amazing. Dota 2 has a coaching system. If you play games of ranked, you can request a coach. This can be a stranger. People are looking for coaches and looking for students and you can connect and you can voice chat and you can go into a game of ranked and the stranger will be talking and telling you what to do. And the best part is if it's not a good match, the coach can leave or you can kick him and stop listening to him. But if it is, then maybe you can learn something. And you can learn something by teaching someone as well. And you can have the joy of teaching someone something. So that's great. And you can, of course, also set this up as two people that know each other. You can pause multiplayer games, mom. <laughs> you can't pause them. Yes, you can. You know, I know Heroes of the Storm, you cannot pause, except if it's a custom game 
like in esports, right? Uh, but you can pause multiplayer games in ranked. And sometimes people wait for you. It's pretty cool. Everyone gets one pause every three minutes. So you can have up to 10 pauses in a row. And this gets used to wait for people. Sometimes people respectfully wait for an opponent. Other times they're like, oh, we're behind. The only chance is 5v4. Let's unpause. But there's even a small artificial delay before an opponent is allowed to unpause. If you double pause. So um, sometimes there's like immediate unpause because the teammate does it, but opponents have to wait a bit. So you always get some time uh, while there's a problem. There's a separate XP gain in gold economy. So as already mentioned, there's a gold economy. Every hero, um, every hero actually has their own XP and gold. If you stand near each other and enemy things die or neutral things die, you share the XP. If you're 1200 plus range away, which is like one and a half times Sergeant Hammer Siege attack range, then they do not share experience of things that die there. So this can be used to bring one player up, or you can leech XP as a healer, as a support, right? So that's pretty cool. And one of the things we never liked much in HOTS is to hear stories about ego boosted players that are the carry and they're the big cool damage dealer and they're the highest level and they can 1v5 everyone that that does happen sometimes but not as often and everyone has a really important role in dota 2 even the supports generally uh the people lower on the farm ladder that don't get as much gold they have really good basic abilities that do not require gold as much to scale and be effective. So think, for instance, uh, Muradin's uh, Stormhammer, right? That's a stun. It doesn't need to deal a lot of damage. It's a stun, so it's good. Uh, take, for instance, uh, Orphea's ulti. It's nice when it deals a lot of damage, but it can pull everyone in and stun them, and that could be how a support ability looks like in Dota 2. It is good by itself. So um, lots, of, lots of fun to be had with that. Then, undefined hero roles and fluid positional roles. So, as you get into Dota 2, you get told what is what, right? So, you get told, like, okay, the, these heroes are agility, these heroes are universal intelligence strength. Doesn't tell me much. What about the roles? Well, it says, hey, you want a safe lane? You want a carry hero? Pick one of these, right? Is Dragonite there? No, he's not. Guess what? One of the high-level streamers... In Dota 2, BSJ just released a guide that Dragonite is such a good safe lane hero now and explaining how to play him. And it's true, we've seen it from top teams. It's going to get more popular most likely. He's not in the list, but it can be done. And that is because there's a huge amount of customizability you can achieve by combining heroes with different items. These are all the items in the game. You can add certain items to a hero and change how they are to be played. Take an Ursa, which is an atta attack bear, and you go with a standard item like uh, Blink, which is like Bolt of the Storm, and then Basher, which is a stun on hit. That's normal. But you can also play him with uh, Octarine Core, which, uh... oh yeah, by the way, you can just type letters and then you find things. It's pretty cool. Uh, Octarine Core, you can play him with Octarine Core. Now, uh, he can get lots of survivability. He can cast lots of spells. It changes the way the hero is played a lot. So that's pretty cool. So pre pretty fluid roles. The game will tell you what should be played where. But occasionally people will come up with harebrained ideas and play heroes that were meant to be a DPS. It's going to be played as a support. Heroes that were meant to be a support as a DPS. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. And it's it's fun to be able to be creative like that. Uh, the equivalent of damage Lily or an Ariel that finishes in top two damage. It's pretty cool. But then in, in Overdrive. Uh, multiple unit control. In Heroes of the Storm, you cannot deselect your main hero. You have multiple unit control via... Uh, via, let's say, sideways. So Vikings, standard control scheme is that all three are always selected. And in order to select others... You need to press specific buttons, one, two, and three, to select them. But like for, for Misha uh, from the Rexar, the bear can only be selected by pressing D. But in Dota 2, you can send units different places. You can send them on their own patrol routes. Uh, 
you can body block with them. It feels more intuitive. And I gotta say, the engine is a little bit better at recognizing specific unit control, body blocks, unit responsiveness, something that always bothered me a bit with multiple unit control in Heroes of the Storm, like with Rexar and with Vikings. It feels a lot better here. It's fast, it's snappy, and that's because it was modeled after Warcraft 3, which is also fast and snappy. And I kind of like Warcraft 3. I'm a fan of the game. I think it's a good one. You should try it out. Uh, you start with one ability, not three, and you pick which one. So Muradin will start with Dwarf Dust, Thunderclap, and Stormbolt. But here, you start with nothing. You can pick one, and then at level two and three, you could pick your second and third ability. But you don't always do that. Sometimes by level three, you will pick uh, a second level of an ability. So Muradin would have level two Stormbolt, level one Dwarf Toss, no Thunderclap. And this actually models itself after how it is in Warcraft 3. So, difference from Hults, right? Uh, they have a, something called Dota Plus. This gives you lots of information, which is super interesting and fun. If you look at the previous game that I just played, you can look at the graph here. And some of this information is supported by Dota Plus, which is a, like, kind of like a monthly paid subscription. Pretty reasonable price. I don't remember how much. I would pay $100 for it. It's probably like 8 or whatever, right? Uh, sometimes you get it for free out of loot chests. Really nice feature. And it shows you the chance you had to win. So this green line, this win probability is offered by Dota Plus. It doesn't show the exact percentage, which is actually a bit of a downside. But from experience, I can tell you this is 99. This is like 70%. So it says Radiant, which was us, the Radiant. That's the bottom left side in green. Uh, this was your chance to win. This shows a massive almost throw, right? We went from 95% chance to just 70 because we almost all died. I didn't. Uh, and that's really interesting information. Uh, furthermore, you can see this plus, this plus, that's from Dota Plus. It shows you exactly how much damage you did to everyone from every damage source. So my spell on Q did this much damage with the exact number against everyone. I think this is so cool. When you buy items that deal their own damage, like Dust of Appearance or Dagon, it shows how much damage they did as well. Really, really cool. It shows how much healing you've done. Um, you can see things like, when did you, like who did you kill in the game? What was your pick order in draft? What was your skill order? Just lots of extra information that sadly we don't have in Heroes of the Storm that would make HOTS so much better as well. Just need Microsoft to take over. Though, and to reinvest. Uh, wind chance graph. Uh, units have turn rate here in Dota 2. So it can take like half a second, maybe not half a second, a quarter of a second to turn one full circle. So if you want to look around, that may take like 0.2 seconds or 0.3 seconds. It's slightly different for uh, every hero. And this matters because I think League and HOTS do not have any turn rate, which means you can spin all you want and it's purely aesthetic, right? If you cast a Stormbolt to the back of you, it happens instantly and you're facing there now. Uh, but here, if you're kiting someone and you're walking away and you want to like fire a shot their way every time, that slows you down. And it doesn't just slow you down. Your Stormbolt doesn't happen right away. So something to consider. It adds a tactical level of depth where you're facing. Sometimes you're ambushing someone and it matters whether you're standing like this or like this. Speed. Uh, there aren't as many skill shots in the game. And usually there's a quicker time to kill in Dota 2. So fewer skill shots, which is nice because, you know, my Stormbolt accuracy, not the best. But sometimes heroes quite, uh, kind of verge into the opposite direction and have a longer time to kill. So you can have, uh, for instance, an axe that just has been having a really, really good game. Every time he kills someone, he gets a quest stack like, um, like uh, Malthael. But he gets armor for it, so it becomes harder to kill. And then if he gets really rich because he never dies and he kills everybody, he can buy lots of survivability. Now you can have five people attacking him and just killing themselves while trying to hit Axe and he still doesn't die. So various different time to kill 
and this offers a level of replayability and uniqueness to every game that you play because generally a level 20 alexstrasza in one game is as strong as a level 20 alexstrasza in another game in heroes of the storm yeah you can pick some different abilities but let's say you picked full e skill build you know level 20 alexstrasza is damn strong and you know how strong she is and she's exactly as strong as another alexstrasza with the same skill build where dota 2 gets really interesting is that there's so much different versatility that gets entered into the different heroes that every single time you can have a unique experience which as you know from warcraft 3 perhaps is really fun and creates a replayable game which is why the game is so evergreen there's only one map but it's bigger it's um uh, let me let me open this up a bit the map is bigger there is only one map but it is bigger uh, and there's more things to do so take a hanamura for instance sometimes you've cleared all the caps there's nothing to do for a while they're not respawning so you're just standing there and hanamura is one of the worst maps we have in hots take a map like garden of terran and, and dragon shire there's usually a lot more to do different objectives but overall this map is even bigger it's like Volskaya Foundry and Warhead Junction together. If you took all the things you could do on both, <laughs> it's all those together. There's lots of different trees that you can also landscape. You can kill the trees. Vision works in an interesting way where it's very reliable for you to be able to predict whether someone can see you or not. So if I'm standing here and there's a tree here, then this person can definitely not see me. And you can see the vision is exactly like that. When I'm looking here at one stump of tree, which was my fist. Uh, and then you can cut the tree and then you can see past it. So it creates lots of different mini games, which is a big departure from some maps in Heroes of the Storm, where there's a set amount of bushes. In those bushes, you're hidden. And those are the primary ganking spots, right? Those are the surprise you've been had. We know these spots on Dragonshire. If you go through the middle triangle, that's an ambush spot. But in between the siege camp and the middle spot of Dragonshire, there are no bushes there. So you can always see when there's someone there, except if they're invisible. In Dota 2, there's a million different ambush spots, which is interesting. And it actually creates way more opportunity to come back via the elements of surprise, because you can very creatively set up traps and part of the reason that people are more gankable is because people always need to be hitting creeps in order to get net worth, gold, uh, and experience. So you've always got a number of players, core players on each team that are going to be showing where they are on the map. They are going to be uh, feeling like they need to greedily absorb some resources, which gives you an opportunity to trap them. Whereas in Heroes of the Storm, the games are shorter, they're more team-oriented, you gr go together as a group more, and because of that, you don't really get to pick any single person off. If at level 21 on Dragonshire, you're alone all the time, you're creating a risk that could lose your team the game. But in Dota 2, you kind of have to be alone. So that's interesting. There's a day-night cycle. It flips halfway point. Uh, during night, there's far less vision, less than half. And you're a little bit faster. That's a recent change. And this creates ambush time. Then high ground mechanic. There's high ground. Uh, basically, you know how dangerous it can be to attack a keep in HOTS because the keep switches aggro to you and then, you know, you take bonus damage. You even lose armor uh, from it. Uh, here it's even scarier to attack the equivalent of a keep. They're called barracks here. Ranged barracks, melee barracks and the high ground tower. It's also called the tier threes because it's the third line of towers that defends uh, the enemy's base. And there's a little high ground there that is at once a funneling death trap. So you're all together, able to be skill shot by everyone on the opponent, AoE. Uh, there's high ground, which blocks vision and gives you a 25 miss chance, 25%. They, there's also a glyph of fortification, more about that later. Uh, yeah, uh, it's all that, basically. Then there's a warding dewarding mechanic. There aren't just Silnaga watchtowers like the watchtowers on Warhead Junction, but there's also wards. They're like a watchtower, but there's something invisible that you place that reveal the amount of vision that a Zilnaga watchtower would reveal. But you can place them anywhere. 
And then the opponent has to buy sentry wards, which are also invisible, and they have true sight. And they're the only true sight to reveal enemy wards. Aside from one thing that doesn't matter right now, the gem of true sight. Uh, so there's a constant battle of setting down vision in key places on the map in Dota 2. And then for the opponent to deward those and to free the vision. It's a guessing game. It's a game of experience. It's a game of intuition. It's a game of watching for the clues where things are. And this is usually the job of the support. And it is very rewarding because vision matters a lot. It's a big, scary, dark map. And because it gives golden experience to the support player uh, to deward. So very, very rewarding. And that's really nice. Then supports. In Heroes of the Storm, we have supports that used to be called supports. And then they were called healers because that's what they actually were. And if you play a support that has no heal, like the old Tassadar with just shielding, that was kind of like griefing. If you played a hero like Tyrannus, you didn't have enough heals, kind of like griefing. Over time, the devs learned that healing is so important in a game like HOTS to keep the non-stop action. So every team needs a healer. And it's big healing as well. When you actually play some Dota, you realize how sick the amount of healing in HOTS actually is. One healer in HOTS can outheal the damage of three, four players sometimes of the enemy team, which is why fights sometimes last quite long. Of course, you can just focus the healer, like focus Morales. <laughs> but it's pretty crazy when you think about it, because in Dota, one healer usually heals less than one enemy hero deals damage. So there's some healing, but it's just a little top off. It's like having a... 50 milliliters of water for a hike in Las Vegas desert. It helps a bit, but it won't go long. So they're not called healers in Dota. They're called supports. And it's not just healing that they do. You can also support through killing. Believe you me when I say that some of the supports in Dota 2 are like Valera or Nova. So the meme that we've always experienced in HOTS, <laughs> where the guy that's supposed to pick heal goes for a cloak assassin douchebag that's real here you've got people they pick damage dealers and gankers and just stunners that have no heal whatsoever and they pick full damage items and damage build and that's a support you're supporting the team by killing the enemy well that sounds awfully much like like a main dps like a core like a carry you know but the only difference is they're not supposed to hit the creeps as much that's why they're a support that's most of the difference and they're supposed to buy wards and stuff. Though, of course, you know, griefers in every game, sometimes they don't. But that's the role of support. It's much more ephemeral, amorphous in Dota 2. And I kind of like it. Then, ganks and ambushes are easier. We talked about this, right? Dota 2 has no mounts. There are boots of speed you can buy that can help. There's teleportation mechanics that you can purchase, like boots of travel. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways to go with it, but no mounts. And what that means is that an already big map feels even bigger. In HOTS, you can rotate as the whole team like that suddenly. Yeah, but I thought I saw you at the top of the map. That's true, but now we're here. Five or ten seconds later because we rode a horse, right? But here, the only way to do that is the town portal. Difference is, in HOTS, you Hearthstone home always. But here you can town portal to specific locations. You can town portal to 20 different places in Dota 2. And hundreds of different places if you buy an item for it. And you can only town portal every 80 seconds though. Or 30 if you buy an item for it. So that creates a lot of false stats, a lot of bright wings that have global presence. But it does cost money and it is not a uh, negligible amount of money either. Not everyone buys it. You would think that everyone would purchase the ability to fly. But th compare it to, let's say, Ariel. How often does Ariel pick level 20 fly? I did it once recently and I cost us the game. I figured if Blizzard put fly on Ariel, it probably has an equally balanced win rate as the others. I was wrong. I was naive. I fooled myself. Damn you, Blizzard. So just like you wouldn't take fly on Ariel, you would also not buy boots of travel on the Skywrath support position four. Usually can happen though if you're very rich. 
but just to kind of drive it home because there could be other things to buy then creep camps respawn every minute which is uh, similar as some camps in HOTS, but other camps, they are like two minutes, three minutes, right? But you can't stack them. So say for instance, on Alterac Pass, when you go for the Hellbats, you kill them every minute, but instead of killing them, five seconds before the minute, you pull them outside of their spawn box, and then the game checks, are there any camps in this box? No, okay, let's respawn them. Except instead of them being dead, they were chasing you and they're unleashed and they're walking back, but they're not back yet. And now there's two camps. So, of course, in HOTS, when you take a camp, it pushes the lane. It becomes yours, like a mercenary, like a hired help. And then it pushes the lane like a lane creep, a minion. Uh, but here, they, they just give gold and experience. Uh, so why would you want to stack them instead of just taking them down? Well, a support could stack them for you. And you could stack... 13 camps in one spot you've got this massive ball of creeps there in the jungle just waiting to be taken by your teammate or sometimes an enemy will steal them yikes and when your teammate takes them your carry that has big aoe splash cleaving attack they're gonna be so happy with it they're gonna say thank you support for supporting me so well thank you for so diligently building up this creep stack and helping me to have such an accelerated farm experience i love my supports they're going to get a lot of gold and experience from that. And the cool thing is, you as a support also get gold and experience from it. The experience being a new recent patch edition. And that gives you an incentive beyond the gratitude of your carry players to stack them. Which is a really nice mechanic. I love that part. Laning phase in Dota is very relevant and interesting and it's deep. Rather than just being a foreplay or an afterthought, like in HOTS. In HOTS, you go to the lane, you blow one, two, or three spells on the wave. You clear it, and you walk away. Job done. It's important to de-push the waves and to push the enemy... Uh, to push your creeps into the enemy tower. But you're not really worried about how they die. Sometimes you walk into a lane after the minions are dead in HOTS, and you still pick up all the XP because of the experience globe mechanic. It's different here. Last hitting matters, which means you place yourself in the lane much more dangerously because you got to be there. You got to be there to hit the thing and they know you got to hit the thing. So they're going to ambush you, right? Uh, but it makes for a really interesting 10, 15 minutes in every single lane. We all know the drudgery of Blaze versus Leoric or Hager versus uh, Thrall nobody's gonna die and you know it at the start of the lane you will hit each other luckily only for three minutes before the first objective spawns and you're gonna leave the lane but those three minutes it's not that exciting usually and it's okay because it's not too long and you get to the action and the objective and the team fights and sometimes you get the satisfaction of a kill because you actually do have someone coming to gank the solo laner in hots but in dota 2 every single second of the lane is so interesting and this is also, of course, one of the downsides, which is why many of us chose to play a game like HOTS as our first MOBA, because the laning phase of League or Dota seemed daunting or tedious or required too much attention. And you may not want to do that if you are just playing with, you know, half an eye on uh, the TV and then you're playing as well, or you just want to chill and you want to just get to the team fight action, which is fun. But... I personally really enjoy the laning phase. It's deep, it's interesting, and there's a lot to be gained and lost, but you almost never lose the game outright after a horrendous laning phase. There are ways to recovery, though it can feel that way. Then, Dota has an active development team and a big tournament scene. And this is, of course, a bit of a sore point. We used to have that as well, but sadly not anymore, and hopefully HOTS will have it again sometime. But at the moment, this is a big plus. We get big patches here. And when I say big, I mean big. A small patch in Dota 2 is a giant patch in HOTS. So a giant patch in Dota 2 is seven hours reading material. That can feel daunting or intimidating as well. But as an active full-time or semi-full-time player, uh, it's really fun because things change. The status quo is upended, if you will. Dota 2 has all chat and additional enrichment communication styles like 
tipping allies and enemies. If you think someone did something particularly awesome, you can give them 50 shards. Shards can be used in the shard shop to buy different skins, which is awesome. This skin costs 75,000 shards. So if people could give me more 50 shard tips, I would be much obliged. However, absolute power corrupts, doesn't it? And what started as a benevolent way to reward each other for awesome plays now gets used to mock people. Sad, isn't it? Mankind. You can also buy mantles of intelligence and drop them on the floor as if to say, here, you need this. You lack intelligence, I got you some. You're not that smart. Actually, you're kind of dumb. Here, have another. Here, have six mantles of intelligence. You're very, very dumb. So you can tell them how you really feel. Yikes. Voice chat is on by default with your allies. Thank God, not with your opponents. Imagine an open communication line to your opponents with voice chat. That would be... Whew, maybe next year? Anyway, uh, so rather than being off by default, it's on by default. And the culture is to have it on and keep it on. Now, I don't recommend that for everyone. I played my first 90 games in Dota with voice chat volume on 0%. If there were any stream snipers, people that knew me, or people, better yet, people that didn't know me and wanted to tell me just how bad I was, it was lost on me. By now, I'm kind of sad that we lost out on that content, because my first games were pretty rough, as you would imagine. But uh, I had it off, and it made for a very tranquil, almost single-player-like experience. Your first games are going to be an unranked in Dota 2. You're only allowed to play ranked after you have 100 hours in the game. And it took me a while. I decided to play every hero once. And you can see my A to Z playlist of every hero on Follow Grubby YouTube. But now all my Dota and HOTS content is on at Grubby Plays on YouTube here. Anyway, the culture is to have it on. But you can turn it off if you don't want to deal with that. Because people aren't always as courteous as you might expect from players who have each other, your allies, as their best resource to win games. For how much Dota players want to win games, or profess to, you would think that they would treat Welcome each other with a little bit more respect, but it doesn't always happen. The rumors, sadly, are true. Sometimes some Dota players are a little bit toxic. Sometimes, a lot. My recommendation, mute. Comeback mechanic comparison. Glyph, buyback, comeback experience, comeback gold, and gold loss. Pretty interesting. As we all know, HOTS has no comeback mechanics, Kappa, as IGN Review said. Of course there is. At level 20 you can lose a teamfight and the game is over, no matter where the enemy team is. They can go all the way from one side of the map to your side of the map and kill your core through a keep out of fort before you even respawn, which can be frustrating. In Dota, that is prevented via several lines of defense. There's the high ground mechanic I already mentioned. The outer towers do like 50 damage, then the tier 2 do like 100, the tier 3 do like 150 damage, and the tier 4 towers do 200 damage. And what's more, there's a 5 minute cooldown glyph of fortification that makes all buildings invincible for 6 seconds, and all towers get split shot. At least every tower except the tier 1. So they get split shot, 5 split shot. So they kill all the creeps that are there, and they attack all the heroes, and they're invincible. And the creeps are invincible for a bit. Uh, and even so that helps to defend and every time you lose a tier tower like the first time you lose a tier 1 tower the first time you lose a tier 2 tower and the first time you lose a tier 3 tower the glyph cooldown resets so not only is it available every 5 minutes but it's also available every premier tower loss additionally you cannot you can barely even kill the enemy towers at all if they have by, uh, backdoor protection and we all remember the back doors with Abathur, where we would copy Zigara. We would get the ult back, uh, Nidus. We would Nidus into the enemy keep, and we'd do a double suicide run on the enemy keep and just keep wearing away all the keeps. And then you just win the game because you backdoor all the time. That used to be possible in Dota 2 as well. No longer is. Here's how they've done it. Your creeps need to be within a certain radius of the enemy defensive structures of that line in order to disable backdoor protection. What backdoor protection basically is, is an insane amount of armor 
and an insane amount of regeneration back to the origin point of when you started hitting it while it had backdoor protection. Might be a little complicated, but I can make it simpler. Generally, you can't kill enemy buildings unless you have creeps there. And for 15 seconds after they die. So what that basically offers is a dimension of strategy where your creeps actually matter. In to the Heroes Earth. of the Storm, three creeps don't really matter. Gloves of haste staff. They offer vision, and yes, there's minions, and there's some catapults, and yes, occasionally you'll get a victory via creeps, but how common is it that you kill two enemy keeps, you have constant catapults, and that it actually wins the game? You have to play extremely strategically and macro-focused in HOTS to get those catapult lanes to actually matter, and you need to use the enemy pulling themselves apart from each other where they contest the objective with just some because others absolutely are forced to defend it's pretty rare until catapults get to the team's level of level 22 level 23 they're generally not threatening enough to threaten the core in any significant way which means killing keeps doesn't feel as rewarding as it could it makes comebacks more uh, possible and that's also part of the charm uh, for heroes of the storm but uh here, because of the backdoor mechanic, uh, you actually need to make sure that if you win a team fight, you first push out the waves. Because without the waves, you can't kill their buildings. And then when you finally do that, your creeps get there, they turn on a glyph. So this does make games longer than in Heroes of the Storm. Uh, it also makes comebacks. Um, it also makes finishing the game quickly after one team fight more difficult. And then there's buyback. If you die, you can use some of that gold to revive yourself. There's comeback XP, just like in HOTS, but there's also comeback gold. You get a lot more gold for people that are placed above you. And you lose a lot of gold when you die. So a team that is ahead, that is absolutely breezing, uh, can do a one unlucky team wipe. In HOTS, you need three of those to come back from a terrible game. You wipe the enemy three times, you get back XP, you gain extra XP, and then finally you're far enough where after the third time the winning team basically all die, you can go and end the game. Here it's more gradual, it's more gray. You get comeback XP and gold for any kill, but especially when you kill the enemy's highest level hero, when you kill the enemy's richest hero. A single kill could put you in the lead, but a single team wipe never wins you the game in Dota. Whereas in HOTS, a single team wipe can. So there's both more easy to get the comeback, but it's also harder to just win a fight and then go and end it. You can vector draw on the map. You can draw phalluses or smiley faces. And you can draw arrows. This is useful communication technique. They have a map editor. They have a map editor. They trust us with a map editor. You know, Heroes of the Storm came out during a time where Blizzard started to really protect their IP. They Blizzard has been pretty notorious for not working with creators. For instance, I have 20 years in Warcraft 3. I have 4 or 5 years in Starcraft 2. I have 7 years in Heroes of the Storm. I have been a pro gamer and I've played hundreds of tournaments. I've casted dozens of tournaments for blizzard maybe 50 plus and i've streamed their games for over 10 years but there's nothing of me in any of the games in dota 2 hundreds of casters have voice lines in the game that can be purchased and that can be played in game so you've got a lot of different creators streamers pro players and teams they have a presence in the game and you can purchase those voice lines Right? They are, there are map editor uh, maps where really cool maps are made inside the Dota 2 client that can also be monetized for the creator, for the map editor maker. So there's a lot more cooperation with the community than in Blizzard game, than in Heroes of the Storm. And honestly, I wish we had that. HOTS could have been a lot bigger if the map editor was there. After all, is Dota not coming from a map editor in Warcraft 3? rhetorical question but the answer is yes <laughs> which is also partially responsible for hots existing because of map editor you know blizzard protect themselves too much to the point that it hurts themselves because they lacked that vision and the agility as an older game company 
to uh, yeah basically make that way open. Uh, console for additional customizability. So basically, you've got all the game mechanics, the hotkeys, the customizability, but you can go deeper and change some things how they work under the hood. It's too much to go into it, but it's a nice thing to have. This one is really capturing a feeling. While you're inside the Dota 2 client, let me ask a question to chat. How many of you ever log into Dota 2, not just to play, and are kind of enjoying themselves just by scrolling through the, the different skins you have, by looking at what heroes do, by looking at your own stats? Me, lol, I do it so much. Me, 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 me every day. So there's lots of different stats to look at. Like, what is my most played hero? What are my win rates? You can look at esports from inside the client. There's a schedule for esports. You can go to the store and check different skins. You can check out what items do, right? You can go into the demo mode, just like in Heroes of the Storm. But the demo mode is better and more customizable. You can control enemy heroes in the demo mode. Normally in HOTS you can only do that with hacks, which only a few YouTubers do or something. But here, I can cast spells with the enemy and myself, so I can test scenarios that are not possible to be tested easily for the common man in HOTS. You can spend hours inside the Dota 2 client without even playing a game and enjoying yourself. You can even be in queue for a game and do these things. You can go into demo mode while you're in queue. And then when you find a game, you get yoinked out of the demo mode. Look, I'm still searching a game. This is crazy. You can open loot chests while you're in queue for a game. You can watch replays while you're in queue for a game. All things that are not possible in HOTS, regrettably. So I really like this part. The client is just a lot better. Like I would give the HOTS client a 2 out of 10 and the Dota client a 9 out of 10. So that's it. That is my onboarding, at least of the mechanics and the differences between Dota 2 and Heroes of the Storm. If you like this, share it with your friends, like, comment and subscribe, prop it up in the algorithm. And if this video gets, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000 views, I can do an onboarding of how the game actually works and kind of explain how Dota 2 works and how to get into it and different roles. Let me know. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed, and sub to the Grub here on Grubby Place. Cheers.